Okay, uh, so we will start now with uh, the afternoon session. So I'm going to talk about a more general topic. So perhaps quite, you've heard a lot of theory, also quite specific testing procedures. So I, my, uh, the topic of my talk is more general um, discussion of the main applications for M fuel cells or also other fuel cells which is essentially um, the mobile application and the stationary application. Uh, first of all, I want to give you a short, very short introduction or give you an information about my institution where I come from. So uh, I'm working for the German Aerospace Center. That's a large research institution in Germany um, with, of course, uh, uh, doing research on uh, aviation, on aircraft, and space. So these are the two major topics, but also energy and terrestrial transportation are uh, topics in which we are involved. And we are also the space agency of Germany, meaning that we also um, uh, are involved in the politics uh, for space research, which you can imagine also um, quite significant on the European level. And DLR is also a project management agency that means that uh, the research, for example, to universities um, uh, funded in the aviation and um, in the space area are actually going through the uh, funding agency of DLR. So um, how can you imagine DLR? DLR is, as I said, um, a national institution. It's like a small version of NASA in, in the United States and Germany. And it's located in different sites. Here you see the sites in Germany. And the main site is actually Cologne, where the headquarters are located. And then there are 13 or 15 sites already now, about 7,000 employees. And offices in Brussels, Paris, and Washington because, of course, space research is um, an international issue and you have to be present in the major cities. For example, here, the uh, European Space Agency or Brussels, the com Commission. Now, my where I'm working is here in Stuttgart, which is a uh, medium size of, um, of uh, for, uh, site of DLR and which has uh, strong points in the area of energy research. Now, just to give you an impression, my, my group, we are about 60 people, and we work on fundamentals and systems for fuel cells, batteries, and electrolyzers. And here you see some of, uh, of fundamental research, for example, a transparent solid oxide, high temperature fuel cell, in order to investigate processes taking place in the cell itself, such segmented arrangements for investigating the uh, distribution uh, of current density or temperatures along the cell testing. Laurent already has shown some results in the, on the project in which uh, we were also collaborating. Uh, some uh, stack development <coughs> and also some system development. Here you see a demonstrator that we have, uh, that we have uh, shown in the last years, a motor glider with uh, fuel cell uh, power trains. And this is actually a fuel cell system uh, used as an APU replacement in commercial aircrafts. Now, what is the content of uh, my talk today? Um, I will give you an introduction to mobile and stationary applications, just the main motivations why fuel cells are used there. Then I will discuss with you the electromobility with hydrogen pen fuel cells and batteries, and also, of course, discuss with you advantages and disadvantages of these two technologies, hybridization of powertrains, fuel cell technology for transport in general. Here I will discuss with you some aspects of also stack development and system development, stationary application of fuel cells, which is for PEM actually mainly the residential application. And here I will discuss with you the current status of demonstration and commercialization uh, uh, programs in Japan and Germany. 
And then, uh, last, uh, the last point will be back up our application uh, for PAM uh, fuel cell systems. Now, um, to motivate why fuel cells are uh, used now or developed in these applications, I have to go to a very general discussion of the challenges we have we face. And this is uh, shown here in these transparencies. Of course, you know that we have reached a point where uh, we have to change things because we face severe challenges as a uh, global community. And one is the environmental pollution and climate change that uh, is in, it's very evident right already now. The alarming increase of energy consumption due to world population growth. It's not that uh, we really uh, have an energy scarcity, but we have an exponential increase in world population and therefore the demand is of course also increasing uh, exponentially. Then there is an increased competition for usage of available arable land. You know, all of you know this discussion about biofuels in comp competition with, um, uh, with food resources. And this is actually also a major uh, um, argument why um, we cannot rely on biofuels in the future. Geopolitical dependencies will increase. So um, we, uh, the energy resources are located in a few countries and other countries are very dependent on these. Uh, so this is also um, uh, a driver. Efficient utilization, of course, of fossil and renewable energies. We are still not using very efficiently our fossil uh, energy. And of course, national uh, politics, competitiveness is a, is a thing, and securement of jobs is also uh, where uh, nations are competing for new technologies. Now, looking now a little bit, going back into a historical perspective, we have seen the growth of mobility over many decades, uh, uh, um, uh, over many uh, decades and uh, uh, centuries. And this is uh, shown here. So this is a logarithmic scale. And this is um, already an older uh, source, but still valid. So this is uh, the distance travel per day per capita over the years, and you see that on a historic perspective, uh, mobility is increasing um, um, uh, here constantly. And of course, uh, first of all, we had uh, mainly horsepower uh, used. And then um, we had the, the invention of the, the cars, of the um, internal combustion engine for <coughs> mobility, which you see here the increase. Then uh, this is the railway, actually. I forgot the railways here, here air traffic, and uh, so on. So this certainly will increase, and will increase also with the world population growth. Now, when looking at the uh, alternatives we have, we have energy resources, of course, we have energy carriers, and we have propulsion systems. So energy resources are listed here. So the traditional ones are oil, coal, natural gas, we will see an increase in the importance of biomass, renewable, for example, from wind, solar, or hydropower, and also nuclear uh, energy will, of course, play in, a role also in the future. Then we have energy carriers uh, here uh, derived from the energy resources, the liquid, traditional liquid fuels for mobility, gaseous fuels like natural gas, hydrogen and electricity. And we have the different propulsion systems here, the conventional ICE, the, uh, ICE based on natural gas, for example, hybrid, hybridized uh, internal combustion engines, which are very successful in the marketplace. In the future, we will see also plug-in hybrids, where you have the possibility to integrate electricity into the mobile sector, fuel cell electric power drive, and pure electric drive based on batteries. So you see here from already this very general scheme that we are going into a direction where electrification <coughs> will play a major important role because this is actually the way to integrate renewable energies into, uh, into the mobile sector. And what you see here is that even for fuel cells and others, the battery technology 
is important in different aspects. So there are different, of course, different batteries which are used, different kinds of batteries. But this shows also that the battery technology is a, a key component in all of these future concepts. Now, what do we have? Here uh, we have the internal combustion engine as a reference point with a high range, high power. And, and this comes into discussion to the um, presentation before and a lot of experience. So meaning that here the, the, this uh, technology is very mature so that the car manufacturers know exactly when they're doing an accelerated test in the lab, this technology will be suitable for, for the customers because they have the experience. And of course, the newer technologies, here you see that this experience it has not been uh, gained yet. And uh, this is uh, actually also the main driver for, for, for example, uh, this um, uh, standardization issues. Internal combustion engine with natural gas has lower emissions. This is a positive part. But you know, gaseous storage means large tanks and still an inadequate infrastructure, meaning that you do not find uh, natural gas uh, refueling stations everywhere. So uh, this is uh, the main disadvantage. Hybrid power planes, plane, trains have um, low emissions, large range. However, the disadvantage that, of course, the system complexity increases, and therefore also failure probability increases, and also the mass increases. Then we have the electric powertrain with batteries. This has a high, very uh, good advantage that it's locally emission-free. And depending, of course, on the way you produce electricity can be also globally more uh, very uh, low emission. Oh, this is still, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to translate it. But of course here, what we have as a disadvantage is that the driving range is uh, low, has a high, has high weight, and of course the loading time, uh, the charging time is very long. And this is actually what is uh, limiting this technology. Um, and then we have the, the fuel cell powertrain. Here we have uh, high efficiency, better range, low emissions, complex technology, and the missing uh, refueling infrastructure for hydrogen as, a, as a negative points here, disadvantages. And uh, I have to say that also these two technologies, powertrains are, of course, uh, very expensive at this point of view. So here, of course, the cost also my main point to be considered. Now, what are the motivations to follow this path, which I said? So here we are looking now at the efficiencies. And we are looking at it, uh, uh, first of all, on the tank to wheel basis. So the internal combustion engine, you have the chemical energy in the fuel. You convert this by the combustion process into heat. This is converted into movement. And if we have, want to have the same basis, electricity basis, then here you have to convert the movement in electricity. Already up to here, we have um, efficiencies in the range of 20 to 25 percent um, with uh, minor potentials for improvements. A realistic uh, <coughs> efficiency from tank to wheel basis for fuel cell drives is 40 to 50 percent. So here we convert directly the chemical fuel into electricity. And the battery electric drive has the best efficiency when we're looking here from electricity to electricity basis. Then we're just converting to chemical energy. And uh, with already available technologies, we can reach 70 to 80 percent of conversion efficiency. Yeah. One good question. Uh, could you give us an idea of the wheel to wheel efficiency? Yes, uh, this will be the next slide. So this is, of course, as uh, already was uh, here uh, commented, tank to wheel. So this is, of course, a difference. But of course, more important is the um, um, th uh, So I will start, uh, continue with this one then. 
sorry, it goes in the wrong place. So this is now the comparison um, from well to wheel. And what is plotted here in this transparency is the CO2 emissions in gram, CO2 equivalent per kilometer versus the energy consumption in well to wheel in megajoules per 100 kilometers. And these are the results on two uh, on on, uh, on uh, studies uh, from European and Japanese sources. And I have to say that there is a newer study on European levels, a so-called coalition study, which I have not integrated in this transparency, but gives you similar uh, results compared to the other ones, from from at least from the CO2 emission and energy consumption. Now, when you look at the combustion engines, uh, the traditional ones, you are here, and even you have this very high figure which uh, Japanese uh, studies uh, give you. I don't understand quite why this uh, value is so high, but still you are in this range here, so you have about uh, 150 grams uh, per kilometer CO2 emissions, and here in the range of 200 to 250 megajoules per 100 kilometers. So when you go to the hybridized systems, so the priors or so, where you integrate a high power battery in, into the concept, you have a significant improvement, but you see it's not a complete uh, um, dramatic improvement versus the CO2 emissions and energy consumption. Now in order to achieve this, all the studies say that you need to have a technology change this is marked here by this uh, by this arrow, and you're coming uh, to the values uh, which you have here, which to a certain extent have also been validated experimentally by the uh, demonstration fleets which are available. So here you are have the fuel cell power train with 100% hydrogen from natural gas. So this is still the conventional fossil fuel route, but due to the higher um, tank to wheel efficiencies that I've showed you, you can already ma make a significant uh, improvement in energy consumption and CO2 emission compared to the traditional technologies. The battery drive is lower because it has a higher efficiency, but this is with power from the uh, U-brick, so this is uh, the European uh, mix in the electricity uh, grid. So this means that uh, some of it is renewable, but most of it is still fossil uh, driven. And then, of course, we can have a dramatic uh, drop in the CO2 emissions if we use renewable uh, hydrogen for the fuel cell powertrain or renewable electricity from for the battery powertrain. This is essentially the figure. And then, of course, you still have the difference here in the energy consumption due to the difference in efficiencies I stated before. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, considering the figure of fuel cell power train from natural gas. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, we hear now controversial you know, views because people from the combustion side they say that uh, fuel cell based on the reform uh, hydrogen is almost matching the diesel engine, you know, this production of hydrogen. So it's not appealing from the carbon footprint point of view. Um, what here is meant here with natural gas, it's not meant that you have an onboard reformer, but that you have the centralized um, station, uh, which you're using now in chemical industry anyway, that you are reforming uh, natural gas to hydrogen, and then you have a distribution system for the hydrogen to the cars. It's not onboard. Yeah, but the carbon footprint in general for production of hydrogen. Yes, uh, it's included here. So um, I, well, I, mean, I cannot discuss with you now exactly figures, but you can look it up. So the newest uh, study is this uh, collision study, and there you is very um, they have very detailed um, um, documentation on 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 the energy on the energy pathway. So the energy. And so what is it? Well, there's also, of course, also discussion and different opinions on the CO2 uh, sequestration anyway. 
but still, uh, the, the point is, of course, we we want to get into future into this to this range to have uh, renewable energies used for for the mobility, and uh, so this is more the transition point into this to this to, to this goal here. Yeah. Can you agree to that? Uh, well, you see, the idea is everybody is defending from his own. Because we had a visitor from the College of London, and he gave a segment of, of, of such kind, which make, uh, you know, we were applying for fund. We affect the decision to give the fund or not. If somebody you consider as a reference, give a statement that, you know, say, oh, there is no much difference for the moment, and the technology is just stabilized, and there is no way of breakthrough for fuel cell anymore. It's just stabilized, and there's no you know, picking up in terms of application, uh, putting them in a real application. Research is mature, already settled, and okay, but so what after that? What's after that? First that of all, the uh, fuel cell technology still uh, has n not reached in any way the maturity of the internal combustion engine. Right? Uh -huh. So even though you have the large industrial uh, development going on, still it's not as mature as the other. So there's significant development potential, for sure. Uh -huh. And secondly, um, secondly, actually, more or less, the last uh, studies on European international level are converting to, to really showing that um, essentially you can think of about the fuel cells in a way you want, but uh, there are not many other options. The options you have is either electrification by fuel cell power trains or by battery power trains. Then, what what the options? The, the other options are all um, not say not leading to to, um, to the environmental benefits yeah. we we expect. In the yeah. uh, the hybrid uh, figures you have um, are they plug-in hybrids or um, regular hybrids? Like they are regular hybrids. So the plug-in hybrids would perform better than this yeah. hybrids. Certainly, they would perform better. So these are actually now uh, um, values from this studies here. So this CONCAF, UCAR, and a JRC study, and from the uh, Japanese Hydrogen Fuel Cell Association. But as I mentioned, there's a newer study, the so-called coalition study on the European level. Now going back to the history, um, actually, when you go back, um, it's quite interesting to note that uh, electric cars are nothing new. <coughs> so they've been around already at the beginning of, uh, of the introduction of cars in general. So, um, so the first electric vehicle was actually demonstrated on a very, say, immature level in 1828. And um, and in the 1890s and early 1900s, actually, you had several uh, electrical cars. Uh, for example, one uh, which was, in a way, practical was designed by Mr. Morrison. And there was even um, a car, the Phaeton, which was uh, uh, produced uh, by a Woods Motor Vehicle Company in Chicago. Um, but they have shown in a decline, of course, you know that the internal combustion won eventually, for the moment at least. And this was, of course, due to the uh, longer range that you can achieve with uh, liquid fuels compared to, um, to the battery uh, power train. Of course, the reduction of the price of gasoline was one major driver. And um, <coughs> the invention, actually, of the electric starter, which made the use of internal combustion engines much more easy compared to before. And then, of course, innovations like uh, Henry Ford, the mass production, uh, which led to, uh, to cheaper uh, uh, manufacturing of cars. Here you see some early um, examples of electric cars. And here, actually, uh, here you see one uh, American one an electrical bus, hotel bus. Uh, and he actually this one uh, is interesting. So 
And you know I'm from Stuttgart, and Stuttgart there has two automotive companies, Porsche and, uh, and uh, Daimler. They have two museums, and when you enter the Porsche Museum, which is quite nice, I can recommend it, the first car you will see is this one, the Lona Porsche. The first Porsche was, was an electric uh, vehicle. <coughs> but then it continued with uh, internal combustion engines. Um, the electric cars at the beginning, they hold the speed records, and for some reasons, I don't know, perhaps uh, Laurent knows, yes. the, the racers were always in France at that time. Yeah? Yeah. Means uh, never happy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the story is why it uh, has been called never happy, because it was <coughs> the surname of the wife of his wife. Because he was then happy, he spent too much time in his garage to work on his car. <laughs> <coughs> so he's complaining. This may also happen with some <laughs> researchers here. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this journey going on. But yeah, what, uh, but for some reason the uh, French were very into car racing at that time. Ah, so okay. um, you know, um, Daimler has also this brand Mercedes, and uh, the name Mercedes actually uh, comes from a French driver uh, that his uh, uh, daughter uh, was uh, is the name of uh, uh, the daughter and because he won so many races actually but not French was Spanish the, the name of the daughter of the Spanish concession but was but he lived in France then <laughs> because uh, at least, at least uh, they are they uh, the races were in France was yes. but okay let's continue so um, here you will see now um, <coughs> a, a transparency which is now from GM, but you will see several similar uh, transparencies uh, from Daimler or from other Toyota, Honda, and so on. So that's how um, the automotive companies look at this issue. So here um, we have the internal combustion. Um, of course, you have still improvements here. Here you have the hybrid electric cars. So, and then they're looking, this is the, um, the time scale, and this is the vehicle electrification, and then they look at the range extenders here, at the pure electric drive and the hydrogen fuel cells in more on the mid to long term uh, area here. Pure electric drive, they see that already they can, uh, they can achieve this in the, in the near term. <coughs> However, you have the significant limitations and eventually the customers will decide um, if they accept uh, a pure electric drive based on battery due to um, some restrictions, technolo technological restrictions in the driving range and in the recharging time. Now, historic perspective again, a discovery to first practical use. Here you see the ICE uh, was discovered very early. The first use was in uh, the end of uh, the 19th century, so 209 years. And then here you see that uh, it took a long time for several other uh, technologies as well. The fuel cells here, uh, this is the first application um, um, leading to the space application and the photovoltaics in this range. So this is another interesting uh, topic to see how long it takes for technologies really to come into practical use. Now, uh, when considering the electromobility from the battery point of view, another thing is that um, the question is, can, do we have enough renewable energy, for example, for battery cars? And this uh, is uh, the result of a German study where you see here um, <coughs> um, uh, the power demand in terawatt hours, uh, the different years, and assumptions about uh, number of electric vehicles, battery vehicles, and here you would then see um, the energy demand for this electromobility, <coughs> these are the yellow bars, and the renewable energies that are planned in Germany. Um, and you can see that this will not be a major limitation um, for the introduction of renewable energies. So it's very much possible to even replace all cars um, by electric drives here. 
Now another thing is uh, the area demand, and this is actually um, based on a study by uh, ZSW, uh, Ludwig is from this institute. So here it was calculated the area demand for renewable fuel for the use of a passenger car with 12,000 kilometers of driving performance per year. And uh, this yellow here uh, means the biodiesel combustion engine. So you would need uh, this corresponding large area of 5,000 square meters. Biomass with fuel cell powertrain due to the higher efficiencies would lead need a little bit less, 1,000 square meters. Um, hydrogen from wind energy plus fuel cell powertrain. Then you make a dramatic uh, decrease in the area demand by square meters. Then we come to the photovoltaic application with fuel cell powertrain, just 65 square meters. And um, then power, TV power for battery, only 20 square meters is the area of the net. So this shows you, yeah, this is for Germany. Um, Specific or? Now, this is this regarding TV, you may depend on the country where you are. Yeah, sure, this is uh, certainly then, uh, this is for Germany. Yeah, mm -hmm. probably, yeah. But I would say that this uh, relation is a general yeah. one, yeah. It, perhaps the yeah, so specific okay. numbers may vary, but uh, this is the uh, uh, now we come to the configuration of electric cars, and here uh, we have the conventional vehicle. And then, of course, we have many different possibilities, which makes also the, the application quite complex to integrate elect electrification into vehicle. This may be the micro-hybrid, which is already available, which is just a start-stop um, function. It will, can be the mild hybrid, um, where you have... Um, the recovery of braking energies. Um, you can have a full hybrid where you have where you have electrical drive, for example. Uh, and uh, then, of course, you can have the plug-in hybrid with the range extender, and then you have a pure electric drive, for example. And the extreme on the right-hand side are the battery, pure battery electric car and the fuel cell electric car and here you will always find the battery nowadays so the fuel cell electric vehicles are all hybridized nowadays so they're taking advantage of the combination of with the battery which improves efficiency by recovering uh, braking energy yes a little bit yeah. but but it's okay. Turn that off. Um, so here, uh, okay, again, the, uh, the hybridization uh, possibilities, I already discussed some of them. So here you see the possible fuel savings, so start-stop um, procedure and the micro-hybrid will give you uh, fuel cell savings of 8%. And one example is, for example, the BMW mini car. Uh, then in mild hybrid here you have um, motor assistance uh, recuperation of the braking energy start stop functions. Here you see some uh, different um, examples and this will give you the fuel savings of 12 to 20 percent. Full hybrid um, here you have already an electrical range so you can drive a few kilometers just pure on electrical uh, drive. Um, fuel cell savings of 25 to 40 percent. This is, of course, here you find the Toyota price as one uh, very already um, commercial car with high acceptance. Plug-in hybrids. So here again, some uh, some cars that um, are available now. Uh, here you have already an electrical range of up to 60 kilometers. And uh, depending on, on 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 the way you operate them, you can have significant fuel savings. You can even just use only electricity, and then this would correspond to the 100% here. One more addition. Sorry. Yeah. This, this is BEV. The Nissan is about 264 pm with one charge. <coughs> Last call. 
That's cool. The Nissan electric EV. Yeah. Uh, Nissan Leaf is 264 km one track. Okay, then. No. Okay. Nissan, Nissan Leaf is the one thing. I heard the 264. We had one. I think we didn't want. And I can tell you it's 150. 150 km one charge? Yes. Are you made the documentation? Are you made the documentation? Yes, the, uh, you made the documentation. I am real driving. Driving. And this is what is very interesting. It's the real driving business, not the data sheet. So it's the same as the data sheet. You are driving, driving 150 km one hour, one charge. So actually, uh, I have to say that uh, what the, the values you find in the data sheets are not the ones you, you find in real driving. Because the data sheet is a, um, a given a driving profile, a given uh, average speed, a given temperature. It's not real life. It's not the fact. Now you understand what I meant. So in our you know, you know, previous... Uh, Specification only good for control. Uh, yeah. If you are driving in these conditions, you will have this average uh, distance, but it is not in a real situation. Okay, now we come to the to the to the fuel cell cars, and here you see one example from GM. So, what are the main components of the fuel cell uh, car? We have here. Um, the hydrogen tanks. So nowadays, most of the companies are following the gaseous um, storage route for hydrogen. You have the battery, often a lithium-ion battery nowadays. You have a bidirectional DC-DC. Why do you need a bidirectional DC-DC? That's right. You have to take advantage of the regenerative braking to improve the efficiency. Uh, front electric motor and the fuel cell system, of course, here. And, uh, now, uh, we've come quite a long way with uh, fuel cell cars already, and uh, that I wanted to show with this transparency is where I started with the invention. Um, then the first, just first demonstrators, um, you cannot even call them prototypes. But then, um, in the 1980s, the real development of the fuel cell car companies for fuel cell drives. You see some, some, uh, some examples. This was uh, the, uh, a van by Daimler, which is still, which you can still consider a lab integrated into this van. So with uh, many controls and, um, and not at all integrated system. Then the Nikar 4, for example, was already what you can call a real car. So with all the functions of a real car, but still some uh, space limitations. Now, uh, then you have the, um, the next um, generation, the XLA class, for example, uh, but also other Toyota, Honda cars. <coughs> now we are here. So for example, the B class of Daimler. I also integrated our motor glider here, but also, of course, all the other larger car manufacturers have their cars which um, <coughs> they are producing in the range of about 200 um, <coughs> cars. So it's not a series, but it's already a quite advanced technology. Few cars, I assume, should be heavier, right? In terms of they're mass, they're, much they're, uh, they're heavier. They're heavier, heavier than conventional cars. How much? Um, perhaps I have the numbers. I have, uh, um, right now, I cannot tell you by but I, I, I think that there should be some transparency with it. Well, um, the technology nowadays is quite mature, I can say. And one demonstration of it was done by Daimler. So this was a so-called uh, Daimler World Drive, where they had three B-class FC cars going around the world, um, so 30,000 kilometers. So how does it, uh, how was it accomplished? Of course. We don't have the hydrogen infrastructure in these different parts of the world. So they had um, the trailers going also this way. So it was three cars and trailers accompanying the, the three cars around this way. And they actually even had some experiences like normal drivers with uh, accidents. For example, uh, this one had an accident, I think, 
somewhere in, uh, here in, in, in uh, no, no, not in Turkey. <laughs> somewhere in uh, Central Asia, they had an accident and but could continue continue his route. So all three actually arrived in Stuttgart. No problem. We can fix it then. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, but what is uh, missing? So you see that the fuel cell technology has already uh, quite significant maturity from the automotive uh, side of view, but what is missing is the hydrogen infrastructure. And now um, there, this is the main um, uh, focus of the car manufacturers, at least in Germany. And I brought here the example from Germany. So there is this initiative of H2 mobility they want to build up their hydrogen infrastructure uh, in Germany. And here you see the plan. Uh, already 2013, there should be 159 hydrogen refueling stations. And they want to achieve uh, 1,000 in 2017. What's the main technology for the of hydrogen? The main technology here still will be uh, reforming of natural gas. But, uh, of course, uh, you know that also Germany is uh, implementing an energy transformation. So they're increasing uh, the amount of renewable energies. And uh, therefore, there are also plans to demonstrate on a large scale hydrogen production from, um, from wind energy. From wind energy. Electrolysis. By electrolysis, yeah. Another one. Chemical looping reform. Chemical looping reform. Chemical looping reform. Reforming, yes. The new one. It's a new process. Yes, for hydrogen from the natural gas. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that. So this is. I am working with it in China for this subject. Okay. Okay. So this is the main task. Now um, uh, I would ask you something. So um, how much do you think this will cost the hydrogen infrastructure to achieve the thousand? Thousand uh, fueling stations. Sorry? At least one billion. More than that. Euro. So four, four billion euros is the amount, uh, the maximum amount that is calculated. So it depends between two and uh, four billion is, is the amount. Uh, but if you take this in relation, it seems like a very large figure. But it's, if you look at, for example, um, just for the during the crisis in 2009, um, the German government spent five billion euros just on promoting small cars for for helping the car industry mm -hmm. at, at that time. Or if you look, for example, at uh, at improving the electrical infrastructure in Germany to enable wind energy to be transported to the south, this would cost 12 billion euros. So even the 4 billion euros here doesn't seem very much. And now if you remind uh, the, um, the financial crisis we have in Europe and what uh, amounts are transferred there, actually 4 billion is a peanut almost. And it's investment in the future. OK? We have to do structure. Oh yeah, you use gasoline stations. You use, of course, the gasoline stations. For example, in Stuttgart, we have a, a hydrogen uh, um, fueling station at the airport. So if you're in Stuttgart, you can look at the, uh, it's this hydrogen fuel station. And of course, it's located nearby where also the gasoline cars are refueled. Uh, 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 no, it's uh, mainly it's uh, you use uh, existing fueling stations. And you put an area, separate area for hydrogen. Do we have enough natural gas for this? Uh, yes, yes, sure. Yeah. We have a problem during the winter time. It is one month uh, cold. That, you know, the, the, the lack of uh, it comes only from Russia. And, uh, Sure, but uh, first of all, you will have only a limited size, uh, number of refueling stations. And as we come approach, uh, this also, of course, uh, also no renewable energies are integrated. So this is actually the plan. We will see how it develops, but uh, there's no, uh, say, principal limitation to achieve it. 
let me ask you about one concept. They call it off-peak electricity. You know, if you have a dam yeah. that's producing certain megawatts, okay? And you know, <coughs> during, the, during the certain time, there's on-peak and off-peak. So the concept of using off-peak electricity for electricity and production of electricity. Right. Yeah, this is what uh, uh, was planned in Germany. So in Germany, you have the problem. You are, uh, you have the main uh, resources for wind energy are located here in the uh, northwest of Germany. So here, actually, they are building large offshore wind plants, and these um, generate a lot of electricity. Sometimes, when you don't need the electricity, so off peak times, as I said. And then you have the problem also that the, um, that the transmission system is not available for uh, transporting such large amounts of electricity. So this means that the concept is really then to use the surplus, if you want the surplus electricity, convert it into hydrogen by electrolysis and use the hydrogen for, for example, for the, for the cars, for the mobility. Okay, uh, now we come to some um, uh, some cars that you can see here. For example, the Chevrolet Equinox uh, is a fuel cell car from GM. Uh, here you see the um, the image of it. it. Has a range of 320 kilometers, a torque of 320 newton meter. The fuel cell system. Has 93 kilowatts. In this case, they are using a nickel metal hydride battery of 35 kilowatts. Uh, has an operation life of 2.5 years, 80,000 kilometers, and an operation temperature between uh, minus 25 to 45 degrees. So this is, for example, one status of technology nowadays. Operation life, either 80 kilometer, 80,000 80, or or two and a half year, or I'm not or sure about that. I would have to ask after, yeah. but uh, yeah, the um, average, they must have average for right? yeah. 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 And here you have uh, somebody of you ask about the weight. Yeah. Here you have the weight of this car. Yeah. So now, uh, when looking at efficiencies. And I hope, yeah, this is a European drive cycle. So uh, there are some standardized drive cycles that was discussed already before. And then uh, what is the difference between um, hydrogen-3, for example, and the diesel Safira, so both GM cars? And here you can see this. So this is, uh, now you see the theory that you have learned in, in the first part. The fuel cell is not, um, always better than the internal combustion engine, but it has its main advantage in the part load range. Um, here, um, in the part load range, due to uh, the <coughs> high efficiency of uh, related to the cell voltage. So, uh, the higher the cell voltage, the higher the efficiency, and therefore you see this main uh, efficiency improvement for the fuel cell driven car in the part load regime, which, depending on the driving cycle you look at, uh, will be more advantage or less advantage. So if you're looking at a driving cycle which has a lot of um, high velocity uh, use, then uh, the advantage of the fuel cell driven uh, powertrain, or the fuel cell powertrain is less compared to, for example, a start and stop uh, driving cycle in Japan where uh, you seldom can drive for long periods of time. See it again? So of course the advantage of the fuel cell drive uh, compared to the internal combustion depends on the driving cycle or on the driving behavior. So it is very good at part load. So the electrochemical systems, the efficiency is related to the cell voltage. Yeah. Therefore at part load, where you have a high cell voltage, you have a high efficiency. And that's where actually the internal combustion engine is very bad. Yeah, sure. yeah. And therefore, if you have a lot of start and stop sure. conditions, like in the city, then you have a high efficiency for the for a high advantage for the fuel cell drive compared to the internal combustion. 
if you have a driving cycle or a driving behavior where you have only highway mm -hmm. driving, mm -hmm. it becomes small. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the main difference. And now we're coming to the stack improvements, and this is also a little bit of a historical perspective. So here you see the power density in what per liter, so volumetric power density versus the years. So here this is the first uh, fuel cell applied to the space application. Uh, you see very low power density. And this is now uh, what, uh, is what you see here, MK45 are the ballot fuel cell stacks. So Ballard was in Canada was one pioneer in this area. And you see how this has been improving over the years. And here uh, is eventually the DOE tar target and the Ballard target which they have published. But you see that uh, uh, essentially uh, you have a, a, a significant uh, technological improvement in the stack. And the last and best value I found in the literature is the one, the recent announcement by Nissan. Uh, they stated that they have now a stack which has 85 kilowatts in a 35 liter package and a weight of 40.8 kilograms and this is a, which means 2.5 kilowatts per liter and 2 kilowatts per kilogram we go back to this uh, transparency I showed you before, 2.5, they are here. For the stack, not the system, I'm talking about stack. Uh, what can you find? Of course, most, a lot of this industrial uh, development is confidential, so you don't find much uh, information about it, but this is what you can find, how they achieve this. They say they have a very uh, thin membrane, they have improved uh, the, the uh, channel width, so they have less inactive parts in, in their active area, and they have a frame integrated mode. Yeah. Okay, um, but I'm now coming to uh, the next generation fuel cell system. So, for example, this is now what GM uh, promises. So you've seen the Equinox fuel cell system integrated in the fuel cell car, which is already produced, say, with numbers of 50 cars or so. Uh, you see this one, and they promise that the next generation will look like this. Um, so less volume, less weight. Um, so they also pro promise that they will have less than 30 grams of platinum in there. So this is also a major improvement. And here you see again the mass value, so 250 kilograms in the present uh, car and uh, 130 kilograms in the new uh, system. Um, so, yeah, and here uh, a tube. So here about the humidification, they are saying they will use a GM design humidifier. Uh, it's unclear what this means, and um, they have a highly integrated uh, system for thermal performance. Now I can ask you, um, when going, well, going back to this Nissan uh, thing, um, there's a tendency right now to improve this integration, uh, which is different from the concept that Nissan is following. Here you still see a stack, a stack with its interfaces. What do you think are people doing right now into in order to improve the integration? We're now looking at a traditional stack like this one. What can you imagine are they doing right now for the system integration? What they are doing or the last uh, trend that is available uh, that is, can be seen in this commercial um, development is integrating system components into the end plates. You've probably discussed the components of a fuel cell step, right? In the, in the yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're integrating fuel cell com uh, system components into the end plate. And this is how they can achieve what uh, GM promises here, this higher integration, less volume, less mass, because they're starting to integrate pumps, they're integrating compressors, 
into into the into the stack configuration. Now, what are the system components that you have to consider when you're looking at fuel cell systems? Essentially, you have this one. You have the stack, which we have discussed now. You have the cooling loop. This may be either liquid or, or um, air cooled. You have the air system, so the air supply system. For example, here with the turbocharger. And you have the hydrogen storage system. And normally what you do is uh, you, have, you need an anode grid circulation system in order to keep uh, hydrogen utilization high, so to keep uh, efficiency high, but also to avoid any um, uh, bad zones in the, in the stack, so you cannot, uh, you need this uh, anode grid recirculation system. So now let me discuss a little bit the development over the years. And I will do this with Daimler cars because this is where uh, I have the most information about. Um, this will give you then a flavor on where the system development is going. Here, uh, this is an A-class demonstration vehicle, which was demonstrated around 2002. This had the fuel cell stack, as I discussed. This had... Um, um, a screw compressor and um, um, for uh, here a screw compressor uh, for a stoichiometry of 2 85 kilowatts these are the power density in which uh, were discussed recirculation of course cooling liquid cooling um, 2 bar over pressure 80 degrees C graphite uh, bipolar plates and the storage of 350 bars compressed hydrogen. This is the status of 2002. So here you had the rotary screw compressor and expander. You had an active humidification, what means you had um, a device evaporating water and uh, putting this water into, into to the stack. And uh, of course, uh, Daimler is using the Bella technology, so it was the uh, stack mark 902. Now, the next uh, development, which is around 2005-2006, was the DCF600, which was a research car. It was not driving, not uh, given to customers. It was a pure research car. And here, major improvements were, for example, this humidification device. So it was not an active humidification, but they integrated this um, hollow fiber humidification system. So here... Um, these are mainly based on personal communications. So the power was 78 kilowatts. Here you see the power density of the stack, the active area, the hollow fiber gas-to-gas -gas humidification, and then a major innovation, electrical turbochargers instead of the screw compressors. And in this case, uh, metallic bipolar plates. And of course, a major innovation also 700 bar compressed hydrogen tanks uh, with 4 kilograms of hydrogen capacity. Now we come to the present. Um, I would say still um, demonstration vehicle, but which is provided to customers. So you, in, in Stuttgart, we have about 10 of these that drive around the city. Mainly ministries that use them. Uh, so here we have a 700 bar tank. We have um, a um, variable speed um, motor, a lithium ion battery, an electrical turbocharger, the new humidifiers with membranes, 500 kilometer range maximum, I would say, 170 kilometers per hour. And when you look at the efficiency, it's about um, um, 2.9 liters of diesel equivalent, 400 kilometers. This is again what uh, Daimler publishes. So they said from, from this research vehicle that I presented before to this B-class, they had this improvements uh, shown here, um, which um, are not available in detail, but just on a general basis. Now, this is... Um, This 
this is now again uh, uh, a general feature of uh, the Celsius fuel uh, cell system. <coughs> so I'm not sure what I wanted to tell you exactly with this transparency. Probably just give you an impression on how the system looks like in real. And these are the main components. Sorry, this is in German, so the translated. So the electric motor, of course, this is now the new fuel cell stack from AFCC. This is uh, the uh, ballad uh, part that was bought by Daimler. This is how the stack looks like, to give you an impression on, on the stack. The 700 bar tanks and the lithium ion batteries. Now, uh, hydrogen, uh, compressed hydrogen gas, of course, quite important. There are already some uh, companies that have certified uh, hydrogen tanks available. And one uh, very important point is that here is a pressure regulator, which has its nozzle lying inside the hydrogen tank. And why would you think is this important? Some of you talked about uh, vibration testing. With this configuration, you can hardly lead to a rupture of, uh, of, of uh, the nozzle. So that's why uh, this component is now integrated inside. And we have tested this for aircraft applications, this configuration, and it withstands even the air aircraft. Uh, um, Considering the conventional cylinder, how, how much would the weight, uh, the weight was reduced in using this particular? Because it's still storage tank, right? These are composite materials with uh, aluminum liners. Oh, so yeah. compared uh, to conventional tanks, can we say like uh, one tenth of the, of the weight of the conventional tank, for example, ten percent? What would you say? Like kilo 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 type four. Type four is not the is type three, but it's a polymer vessel yeah. and uh, thirty-seven liter, which is a common. Uh, uh, it's about uh, twenty. 20 kilograms per, per vessel. So you think so this is like kilogram or yeah. one kilogram yeah, of uh, yeah, yeah, hydrogen? What, what so we are about 5 percent uh, weight per cent of hydrogen with okay. yeah. uh, compressed hydrogen. Until 350. <laughs> and so uh, if you are 70, you have almost not uh, wow. a little less than 1 kilogram, but uh. about 1.5 kilogram you mean hydrogen. And really? Near to 7 percent uh, weight per cent using type 4. Okay. So this is you mean in comparison to the steel cylinders? Yeah, it's a conventional cylinder. So a conventional, it has a different like 50 bottom. Uh, uh, where you have a four mm -hmm. miles, we have about uh, ten mm -hmm. cubic meters, no more cubic meters. Because this is a lot of hydrogen, and it's about more than 15, 70 kilograms. Yeah. So you make the difference. You have uh, about uh, you are going. 40%, uh, 60%, it's about 1 kilogram hydrogen for 70 <laughs> kilograms of bottle. Tank is nothing anyway. In a car, <coughs> so you can use the idle 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 idle. more than the fact it's true, it's worth by the tourism. Okay, I will look it up and then tell you. Even if it still doesn't work. Okay, uh, compression of air. So here, um, here you see what is known. So nowadays, a turbo compressor expander, for example, from Honeywell, is used. Here you see the uh, how I'm doing actually this time. Still on time? <laughs> okay. Here you see the um, the values for that. So in the past, uh, as I said, the screw compressors were used. For example, one company that provides them is Ofcon. Um, then um, problems, of course, with turbochargers is the stall line. So you have a complex control system, um, high pressure ratio, which means the complex dimensioning of plate and rotation speed. And of course, also the demand for oil-free <coughs> operation, which is important because um, uh, sacks don't like oil. They're driven by electricity. Yes, yes. So the turbo charger concept. So it's two different models. Yeah, you have a compressor and expander. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, I'm already 
overtone, yeah? The key. Yeah. Um, so I will go faster when it's yeah. so. Uh, 50 minutes? 15. One part. Okay. Okay. Oil free operation, do you need to filter the air? Is that what you're saying? Do you need to clean the air? Oil free? No, the compressor has to have an oil free operation. Because the oil in the air is not good for the. Good for the stack, yeah. I have to go a little bit faster, therefore um, I'm going through the, the other system components, you can look it up. So unit that I already talked to you, that was a major uh, innovation. H2 recirculation can be done either by ejectors or by recirculation pumps. Um, and then of course the cooling is a major issue. You know that fuel cells have a high efficiency but still need to reject 50% of their of the lack of the uh, energy in terms of heat, and this means that you need um, a very uh, high-performing uh, cooling system because if the outside temperatures are 50 degrees C and your stack is operating at 80 degrees C, you have not much temperature gradient. So then you can look here up at the, at the concept that uh, Daimler has, has introduced in his uh, car, and you can see that it's a quite um, it's more effort compared to the traditional cars in order to achieve this. This can also be seen here in this image. Now, uh, since I'm running over time, I will go to the stationary application. And this is um, uh, the main driver here is, of course, that you use a cogeneration of heat and power. So when comparing um, traditional way of generating um, electricity and heat, we would have the uh, connection to the electrical grid, which may have an efficiency of 40%, for example, and the boiler with an efficiency, for, for example, of 85%. If you combine in a combined heat and power generation system, then, of course, you can uh, generate electricity and heat by one device. And now it, uh, you have to um, develop this device to have a very high total efficiency. And this way you can actually avoid the uh, losses, for example, um, that you have, or part of the losses that you have just by having this separate generation. So this is then um, it, how the, such a stationary power plant would be um, would work. So um, essentially you have this combined heat and, uh, and electricity generation. It may be from hydrogen, but nowadays people are looking at natural gas because you have a distribution system for natural gas. Now here when you're looking at the PEM fuel cell, we have to discuss one uh, limitation of the PEM fuel cell. So this uh, shows you the operating temperatures for different fuel cell technologies, and the PEM fuel cell is uh, down here. This means, uh, this low temperature means that if you uh, work with fossil fuels like natural gas or hydrocarbons, you have to remove a lot of um, uh, contaminations. For example, the first one is sulfur, which is also true for the high temperature fuel cells, but then you need reactors to convert hydrogen to CO2. You need the so-called shift reaction to increase the amount of hydrogen and decrease the amount of carbon monoxide. And, and you need also some device which uh, lowers the CO concentration to a few ppm's in order to be um, compatible with the polymer fuel cell with the, um, with the platinum devices. So here you see the different reforming actions. Um, Probably they were discussed uh, in lectures before. You have the steam reforming, where you have a high hydrogen yield, and you have the catalytic partial oxidation, and you can combine this actually with steam reforming to the so-called orthothermal reforming, where the heat uh, management is optimized. Now, um, I will come, due to my time limitations, uh, to fuel cell technology for residential applications. So uh, these are the main drivers. You have essentially a heating device in the residential application with power generation. 
So you heat your house, but you can also generate electricity and thereby lower your electricity bill. This is the main business case for this. Um, and of course, there are also uh, higher efficiencies and therefore lower emissions. So this is, of course, a positive association. And of course, uh, fuel cell systems are always modular. So you can think of uh, uh, building up also modules for, for other applications. Now, this is how a residential system looks like. You have essentially your fuel cell system based on natural gas. That's uh, how, how they are mainly doing it. You have the boiler and you have a hot water storage tank. These are the components. So this already shows you that heating is the main application and the fuel cell provides some part of the heat, but also um, electricity, and thereby you can lower your, your electricity. Based on the, the natural gas today we are using, or the, the sulfur yeah. is still removed? Right, yeah, there's a desulfuration the as well. uh, in, in in integrated the, in, the, in, the, in the fuel cell. Yeah. Now, okay, what are the differences between different uh, uh, CHP technologies, so combined heat and ratio? There's, of course, the Stirling engine, there's the Rankine circle, we can also uh, use internal combustion engines. Essentially, it's a heat to power ratio. So these um, technologies have a high heat to power ratio. So they're producing new heat and electricity. And the fuel cell technologies have a low heat to power ratio. That means they are producing, um, in relation, less heat compared to the electricity. But these are competing. Now we are coming to the Japanese uh, experience. <coughs> So the Japanese uh, use a lot of uh, heat for, for hot water. So this is shown in this, uh, in this transparency from Japan. So essentially here, this is the main distinction. They are using 35% of their energy consumption for uh, hot water. And um, then this is a specific of, of the Japanese market. What kind of fuel I'm just talking about PEM fuels. Yeah. But they have, of course, also, um, solid these oxide. are competing with the solid oxide also. So this is uh, um, the configuration in Japan. We have a hot water supply, a generation unit, uh, one kilowatt class about. And here you see the the different uh, systems. So here the gas engine, which was already introduced in the market, which is commercial. Also heat and power uh, thing, the PEM fuel cell, which has a limited market entry right now. So they are sold about 10,000 um, of these devices last year. And the SOFC, which uh, is going into market entry this year. So here you see the differences in efficiencies. So uh, the SOC has a higher electrical efficiency compared to the PEM fuel cell. Now this shows you the market development. So the Japanese had a field trial, a market preparation period between 2005 and 2008. And in 2009, they had this, uh, uh, this commercialization of these residential units in a subsidized market, so the state the, the federal state in Japan is paying about one third of the system costs uh, for, in, for, for this uh, fuel cell systems. Here you see the, the residential cogeneration systems from Tokyo Gas. This is one of the, of the, the companies selling the systems to customers. Um, the fuel cell systems produced are from Panasonic and Toshiba mainly. Here you see some data uh, from the Panasonic fuel cell systems. The electrical efficiency you see is in range of, um, of uh, 32 to 35, depending on the power output. And this is the first commercial model here, and the red ones are the newer model. This is uh, the primary energy savings, but this compared to the separate um, separate production of uh, electricity and heat. 
So they uh, show here uh, significant um, energy, primary energy savings. Now, um, also in Germany, this is now in the field trial basis. Uh, due to the time limitations, I will just uh, give you some impressions on the field trials in Germany. So this is done through the so-called Calux project, where um, uh, different um, utilities, different uh, manufacturers like Baxi, Hexis, and Weiland are testing residential applications. But from these, actually only one is a PEM system. So this is a Baxi Inotech fuel cell heating ap appliance gamma. The other ones are SOC systems, the, the Galileo system from Hexis, and the Violence system is also a SOC system. Now here of interest is of course only the PEM uh, system. So here you see um, it has uh, a total, it can achieve a total efficiency of 91% heat and electricity combined and the electricity, electrical efficiency is at 32%, so in the range also of the Japanese systems. Now, okay, I will go on. This is uh, the roadmap of Baxi. So they um, promise that they will have a mar market entry in 2013, so next year. Okay, um, then, uh, just a short comparison of low temperature and high temperature PEM fuel cell. So low temperature fuel cell, um, um, you've heard a lot of it, but there's also the high temperature PEM fuel cell, which is based on polybenzimidazole, which is um, a, a phosphoric acid doped membrane. So it's actually phosphoric acid uh, with a high temperature uh, polymer backbone or unit. So uh, the advantage is that uh, it has no water management. Um, it has a high conductivity at low relative humidities. It operates at 150 to 200 degrees C. has no electrosmotic drag, so it's much easier at the management. However, it's less mature and there are some possibilities for degradation like acid dilution and has no cold start capabilities, which what was... What is the water management system eliminated there? Yeah, it's almost, uh, there's no water management really. This is uh, how the, the membranes look like. So this is the benzimidazole and this is one uh, data from literature. And I'm discussing this because there's a uh, in the United States has actually this uh, clear edge power, which is developing uh, high temperature PEM for micro CHP in the US. And uh, they are ha having quite considerable numbers of uh, systems in the field in California. So uh, that's why um, I just wanted to mention to you this alternative way of, uh, of demonstrating um, um, residential uh, applications. Here it has to be mentioned that the, the powers are higher compared to the European and Japanese uh, application. So here um, the power is in the range of 5 kilowatts that the system that PRH is producing. So yeah, here the advantages of using high temperature PEM from, from their presentations. And now I'm coming to the last application I want to discuss with you is the backup power application for fusion system, which has very different, um, very different um, requirements. The number of uh, start-stop cycles are very few, since it's a backup system. Um, the operating hours uh, may differ from one to hundred hours, so very different from the other applications where you need, for example, at least forty thousand hours. Um, however, the probability of non-startup has to be quite low, so it has to be very reliable. And also the mean time between failures has to be uh, very good. So these are very different, um, different um, requirements. 
and also significant the lifetime should be 15 years so this is also uh, uh, quite difficult to achieve with this reliability I mentioned before so there um, there are for example backup applications by hydrogenics so this is one example from the United States and Canada where um, they are delivering this backup uh, power systems for different uh, commercial applications and there's a demonstration program called ARA uh, which uh, you see the numbers here so this uh, red one is a, a backup power application um, where you see the numbers going up to to over 700 here uh, which are in operation right now okay um, oh yeah, just to, to finish, with backup systems you have also a diff uh, to consider that maybe uh, more suitable to use pure oxygen systems because pure oxygen systems have um, the advantage that um, um, the, the, the startup is much quicker if you have a high concentration of oxygen instead of air. Uh, it's clean, quiet, and pollution free, so the reliability increases. Um, it's completely independent of external conditions where it has an oxygen tank and therefore also the availability and reliability improves and that's why in the backup application actually um, pure oxygen systems are favored compared to air okay with that I, I thank you for the 